So we are going to be looking at molecular evolution. And really when we when we think about evolution, this is where we're at right now. We are we are really focusing on molecular evolution in the field of evolutionary biology and even some of the traditional um, evolutionary biology studies that are strongly rooted in morphology um, or looking at, at fossilized evidence and then trying to compare all of the, the morphology of, of other organisms that we have fossils of. Even those areas we see are increasingly relying on molecular evolution. Now, in order to talk about molecular evolution, I really do want you to understand that um, that this part of evolutionary biology is going to be specific to the organism that you're studying. So let's say you're interested in plants. If you're interested in plants, then you would have to become very, um, very versed and very knowledgeable in the DNA um, genes and even RNA and protein comparisons of different kinds of plants. If you're really interested in sea slugs, if you're really interested in the nautilus, if you're really interested in lions or primates, you would get first um, educated in the organisms that you're curious about, their DNA, the proteins, all of the mutations and epigenetic patterns that exist, and then start to apply concepts of evolution. So in this chapter, what we're just going to do is we're going to kind of glance over some specific examples of molecular evolution, uh, mainly because they, they are important to understanding humans, understanding where we're at, um, and just getting a feel for, for how molecular evolution plays out for different specific organisms. So what I love about this picture is that this picture is showing us um, sort of an overview of what we do in evolutionary biology. In evolutionary biology, we have the organisms that we see off to the right here. We have the mouse, we have the human. We're looking at those organisms in real time. And what we have to do is we have to back calculate how did they get to be this way? And what I love about this diagram is that we have um, some some kind of last, most recent common ancestor, and then we can see all of those evolutionary paths. Now, if we're, we're thinking DNA and genes, these are all the genetic changes that could have happened that give us the organism that we see today. If you notice that the dotted line, these are all the unrealized potentials. In other words, different mutations, different epigenetic changes that could have happened, but those never occurred. We've got the red dotted line that shows us inaccessible paths. And what this is really alluding to is the idea that some things were never going to be possible. Some mutations, some changes would never have occurred. So it, it gives us this kind of overview of what we do in evolutionary biology where we've got the current observation and we're thinking back, going genetically backwards to, to try and see the connection between ancestors and the organisms that we are observing today. So essentially in evolutionary biology, focused on only morphology, we are stuck with these kinds of questions like could birds and in insects have had the same common ancestor because they are demonstrating convergent evolution. They're using two very different types of structures to be able to fly, but at least they're able to fly. So should I be thinking of all flying organisms as being related? And when we look historically, this is what people like Darwin, Wallace, Buffon, what many of those scientists at the time were, were thinking and, and kind of how they were grappling with their observations. Now we can look back and go, well, of course a bird and an insect could never have been related. Feathers versus this exoskeleton modification of a wing. Like, no, these are two very distinctly different organisms that were never on similar um, evolutionary paths or more accurately, we would have to go so far back to find the last most recent common ancestor that it's it's almost irrelevant to ask that question. So here are some examples where we have morphology that has contributed to our understanding of a species. And if we think back to our coelacanth um, into the jungle chapter, 
One of the things that we focused on in the first half of the semester is the morphology. How that morphology helped us see the coelacanth and tectalic and all of those species in between as being the missing links between fish and life on land. Now, the nice thing about molecular evolution is that with molecular evolution, getting a hold of the DNA and doing gene comparisons, we now see um, as of 2013 that the relationship for the coelacanth to the lungfish, other fishes like the tilapia, and then going towards things like the frogs and the finches and all of the other tetrapod type animals, we see that the coelacanth's position in the phylogenetic tree is supported by DNA evidence, not just the morphological observations that um, were made to, to place the coelacanth in that phylogenetic tree. The textbook also talks about Darwin's finches. And if you remember talking about Darwin's finches, the interesting thing um, was resource partitioning being shown on some of the different islands between the different species. Looking at the DNA evidence, we see how related the species are to one another, and we can see um, exactly how speciation gave rise and what I like um, gave rise to the species that we see today. And what I like about this phylogenetic tree is that it shows us the the different islands and it shows us the different species names. So there's a lot of information going on here in this phylogenetic tree. Make sure that you study it and you understand how this phylogenetic tree is helping to support resource partitioning. Go back and revisit that concept of resource partitioning um, if you're struggling to remember. The other thing that the textbook talks about is um, it talks about how we um, scientists were able to figure out HIV um, and how that virus was related to other immunodeficiency viruses. And in this case, trying to track how HIV came about because when we discovered HIV in humans, it was really shocking. It was um, unexpected and we didn't know how that would have happened. So when the technology developed and researchers could sequence the HIV virus, they could then trace those sequences based on similarities and differences. And what this is showing us is that the human HIV strains are very closely related to the chimpanzee um, HIV strains, or I'm sorry, SIV strains, and that we see that the, the primate version of HIV is very closely related to the human version, which is why we now have that conclusion that the immunodeficiency virus jumped from the primates to the humans. Now, this isn't the first time that we've seen a virus jump from one species to another species. And that's really the key uh, that I think a lot of people are starting to understand right now. Um, what I love about this picture is that it's tracing the HIV clusters in humans based on geographic locations. The reason why this is so important is because when a virus starts to move through a population, those individuals' bodies, their immune systems, exert selective pressure on the virus and those viruses will often accumulate mutations so the one thing we want to do is we want to get as many different virus samples from as many different individuals within a group within a, a population of individuals we want to see what kind of mutations are occurring and we want to see how those mutations in, in one population relate to mutations in others this allows us to be able to track spread across, in this case, humans. And when we're talking about tracking the spread of a virus in humans, we are really talking about tracking the spread of, human, of a virus in humans across the entire planet. This can help us with treatments. This can help us with, um, if we have it available, vaccinations.
it can really help us to stop the spread or deal with the spread in different locations and to start to figure out the other ramifications of illness for the individuals who have this virus. So another virus that is spreading through the human population is HPV. And here we are looking at the HPV virus being sequenced. We see all of the different types, and this ends up being important. Again, different individuals will have different types of HPV virus, and we can track how those how the virus has moved through the population, how it's accumulating mutations. And the case of HPV, because different types are strongly correlated with cervical cancer, this um, being able to track the virus, track those mutations, can help us understand larger illness. For example, let's say the population in Rockford, Illinois has HPV 16. Now this is generally spread through sexual interaction. And so what you might start to assume is that here in Rockford, Illinois, because the HPV virus is spreading through this population, that you may have a higher incidence of cervical cancer. If you are running a hospital, if you are a medical practitioner, if you're just a, a human walking around on the street here in Rockford, you may want to know this. This is going to impact your larger community. Uh, here in this phylogenetic tree, what I do like is that we have these numbers associated with e each of the nodes, each of those evolutionary events. So if you notice here, between HPV4 and HPV16, we have an 87% probability that the mutation occurred to give us these two separate strains of the virus. We can't really call it speciation because a virus is not living. So using genetic comparisons, and we often have protein comparisons that have a similar phylogenetic tree, um, these comparisons allow us to really understand the origin of disease, the spread of disease, and can help inform the larger what happens next, what happens to the larger community. So generally what I'm talking about is this field of epidemiology. Generally defined, epidemiology is the study of diseases, their origin, how they spread, and increasingly, mutation of disease agents. It's all about informing that larger picture. What are the larger impacts once we have a good understanding of the biology of the disease? So this leads us to the discussion of coronaviruses. The first thing I want to point out with this phylogenetic tree of coronaviruses is the idea that there are so many different types and so many different species have uh, coronaviruses. So if we go down here to this green clade, I just, it blew my mind. I didn't know the beluga whales could have a coronavirus, but there it is, the beluga whale coronavirus. It's very distantly related from coronaviruses that you or I might encounter. But the reason why these phylogenetic trees about these viruses become so important is when we have a situation like the SARS-CoV-2, the um, coronavirus that is giving rise to uh, the COVID disease that we are familiar with. So when um, people in China first started seeing this disease, when they started seeing the symptoms, and they got a hold of the virus and they sequenced that virus. That DNA genome was released to the larger scientific community. It was made public. The reason for this is because other scientists would get a hold of that and go, oh my gosh, here's this new virus that we have never seen before. Thank you for getting that RNA sequence out here. We've got the database of it. We are now going to compare it to every other virus we have ever studied. What's it more similar to? That allowed us to make a phylogenetic tree like we see here. And what was discovered fairly early on was that the coronavirus that has given rise to COVID disease, originally labeled and titled the Wuhan 2019 virus because of the location where it was discovered, um, that coronavirus 
is very closely related to a bat coronavirus. And this is why scientists can make the co conclusion that the SARS-CoV-2 virus that gives rise to COVID-19, that virus most likely jumped from bats to humans. Now, how that might have occurred, we have to, to get more information to, to start to figure that out. But the other thing that's important here is to look across all of these different types of coronaviruses that have been sequenced and to stop and pause at a few of these. Here we have the MERS virus, and MERS um, is the Middle Eastern Respiratory uh, Disease that is based on a coronavirus. And what was discovered is that the human coronavirus was very similar to the camel coronavirus. If we notice and look back just a little bit here at the human camel clade, we see that there's a 100% probability that the mutation that gave rise to the human version of MERS came from or is most closely related to the camel MERS coronavirus. So study these clades closely. Pay attention to these places where we see human and other animals and the closeness of those viruses in their sequences. The reason why this is important is to drive home the idea that viruses can jump from animals to humans, and we suspect from humans to animals in some situations. This isn't an unusual situation that we're seeing with COVID. If it's not an unusual situation now, can we expect this to happen again in the future with other viruses, with other situations? Now, the other concept that is important here in this chapter is the concept of neutral evolution. So if we pay attention to uh, Kimura's theory, the first step here, the, the first aspect of Kimura's theory is this idea that most variation in genomes is due to genetic drift. I want to pause for a second here and point out that genetic drift, those random events that change gene frequency. What this person is asserting is that genetic drift drives most of the genetic variation in a species. Now that's very different from what we've been covering this semester where we've really focused on the idea and most evolutionary biologists focus on the idea that natural selection drives a lot of genetic variation. Here, we have a person who is asserting that genetic drift, random changes, are um, is, is what drives a lot of the genetic variation in the species. So keep that in mind because that might be a weakness here in the theory because how often does genetic drift happen within a species? So the other assertion is that neutral mutations will become fixed at a regular rate. And when we're talking about neutral mutations, we're talking about mutations in, a DN in the DNA which doesn't affect the protein or the organism's fitness. So we're looking at some of those maybe point mutations or silent mutations that aren't necessarily uh, generating um, changes in fitness or survivability. So when populations split and diverge, we see that the separate populations will start to develop and accumulate these neutral mutations. We can track those and we can look for similarities and differences so it's a slightly different perspective. Instead of looking at the genes that cause phenotypes like fur color or eye color or striping or all of those things, instead we're going to look at those mutations that accumulate but don't seem to affect uh, phenotypes associated with survivability. So the more distantly related species are, the more mutations we will see in their DNA. The more closely they are related, we will see less of those neutral mutations accumulated. So one of the things that people will look at fairly regularly will be the cytochrome C protein in mammals and in other animals looking for these uh, neutral mutations. So looking at this phylogenetic tree of the cytochrome C protein, we have everything from fungi to 
turtles to birds like ducks and chickens. And then we have a whole host of different mammals. And we're looking for those changes, those mutations in the cytochrome C protein. Now, the key thing to keep in mind is all of these organisms are making cytochrome C proteins. It's a protein that's important in electron transport chains. So everybody's making it. But the question is, how many changes or differences do we have in the DNA? And we can look for those changes and differences in the amino acid monomer sequence. So we often compare the protein sequence of amino acid monomers and then trace that back to the genes or the DNA. So one of the things that this phylogenetic tree is saying is that the human is very distantly related from the fungi. There are a lot of mutations that have accumulated between the human and the fungi. But when we look at the human and the monkey, and we compare the amino acids and the resulting DNA, what we find is that the accumulated changes are very small. There's very few of those. So it's another piece of evidence supporting the idea that humans and monkeys are more closely related than humans are to any of the other mammals, like dogs and horses and kangaroos and the rest of the marsupials, um, and then going even further back, all the way back to um, things like fungi that we are very distantly related to. So then this helps us to understand something like a molecular clock. So the molecular clock has the underlying assumption that the mutations accumulate at a predictable rate. There's been some mathematical modeling on the accumulations of mutations. And this then is used to help show similarity and differences to show how speciation progresses over time. So when we look here at figure 7.8, what we see is this um, molecular clock. Taking a look down here, we have the amount of time. We have the amount of mutations that have occurred in the cytochrome C uh, gene. And we can see a lot of different mammals plotted along looking at the predictable rate of accumulated changes in the gene that gives rise to the cytochrome C protein. So this would then tell us our human, our kangaroo is very distantly related from our sheep, goats, horses, and donkeys. And we've got somewhat of a time frame. Now when we look at the molecular clock, when we look at this mathematical modeling, this starts to look a lot like the gradualistic model. Remember Darwin and colleagues put forth the gradualistic model of evolution. But we know and uh, science supports the punctuated equilibrium model, that species remain the same for a very long period of time, and we go through these relatively rapid changes or these rapid speciation events. So keep that in mind, that the molecular clock is handy, it's nice, but it may not be the most helpful tool if we're trying to look at speciation, we're trying to look for most recent common ancestors, we're trying to see that progression over time. But it is another perspective on evolution. So our final concept that we need to cover in this chapter is endosymbiosis theory. And endosymbiosis theory is awesome. This comes about from the idea that eukaryotic cells have chloroplast organelles. In our top picture, it's the chloroplast organelles are the little green balls inside of our geometric shaped plant cells. Then down below, we have our mitochondrion organelles. Both of these organelles are involved in producing energy. Chloroplast organelle does photosynthesis, grabs sunlight energy, and makes glucose. And the mitochondrion down below is part of breaking glucose to make lots of ATP energy. But the confusing thing about both of these organelles is that these organelles have separate membranes. The chloroplast organelle has three separate membranes. Its DNA is separate from the DNA inside of the nucleus. The genes in the chloroplast organelle are more closely related to bacterial genes. And in our mitochondrion down below, it has two separate membranes. It too has its own DNA that's separate from the nucleus. And again, the genes are similar in the mitochondrion are similar to genes that we find in bacteria. So this made scientists um, very confused for a long period of time. 
How could we have these two organelles that have their own separate DNA, have multiple different membranes that almost look like little entities living inside of this larger cell? How did this happen? How could this have occurred? This is where we get endosymbiosis theory. So what happened was we had a large eukaryotic cell. In this case, it's the blue and purple cell here. And what it did was it engulfed a prokaryotic cell, the smaller red bacterial cell that we see here. When it engulfed that cell, it didn't kill it. Instead of the eukaryotic cell killing the bacterial cell, it formed a relationship with that cell. The bacterial cell made energy for the larger eukaryotic cell, and the larger eukaryotic cell gave that bacterial cell protection and gave it some of the components it needed to survive. So we have this symbiosis between the two different types of cells. So here we see a cartoony picture where we have our original eukaryotic cell, our little purple nucleus, and this eukaryotic cell is going to engulf a bacterium that over time becomes a mitochondrian organelle. Now in the case of plants, plants had to go through endosymbiosis twice. The first endosymbiosis would have been a eukaryotic cell grabbing a hold of a bacteria that eventually becomes a mitochondria. But then the plant also has to go through a second endosymbiosis. It has to eat a separate bacterium that will eventually become the chloroplast organelle. Plants have both chloroplast and mitochondria, which is why they're called autotrophs, cell feeders. The chloroplast using sunlight to make glucose, the mitochondria being part of the process to break that glucose and make ATP energy. The plant cell is essentially feeding itself with both the chloroplast and the mitochondrian organelle. Now, one of the interesting things about both the chloroplast and the mitochondrian organelle is that these organelles exist inside of the egg of um, sexually reproducing organisms. So what we can do is we can take the DNA from the mitochondria, or if we're dealing with plants, the uh, DNA from the chloroplast, we can sequence it, and we can compare mitochondria and chloroplast DNA through the maternal, through the female line, through multiple different generations. Because when the egg is fertilized, the egg contributes the mitochondria, the egg contributes, if we have a plant, the chloroplast organelle, and so it's always the maternal female line, the egg, that is passing on those organelles to the next generation. So if we just take a step back and think about this personally, every single mitochondria inside almost every single cell in your body, all of those mitochondria came from your mother. I don't know how you feel about your mother, but you do have this connection to your mother through the mitochondrian organelle. All of her mitochondrian organelles came from her grandmother. Again, I don't know how you feel about your grandmother, but you are connected to your grandmother through these mitochondrian organelles. You're connected to your great grandma. Your great, 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 great grandmother. We are all connected through that maternal line, through those mitochondrian organelles. They are only passed on through the egg. Now, from a molecular evolutionary point of view, we can compare the DNA. We can trace those changes through the mitochondrial DNA, that maternal line. The nice thing about this is that we can eliminate 50% of the variation, right? Because if we can only, if we're only tracking the, the gene changes through the mitochondrion, we know that the, the paternal line doesn't, like, didn't influence this. This is just that one branch and following those accumulated changes. So that's nice. We can get a really refined view of accumulated changes in a line of descent by just looking at the mitochondrial DNA, the mitochondrial organelle. So what I like about this final phylogenetic tree, summarizing endosymbiosis theory, is that we can see that most likely, this endosymbiosis between eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells 
has probably happened multiple times. And this then influences all of the lineages, all the speciation that come in, that comes after that initial cell grabbing a hold of a bacterial cell and instead of killing it saying, let's form a relationship. And then when I sexually reproduce, I will pass the cell on to the next generation so that we have this consistency, this continuity through the organelle, not just through the DNA and the nucleus that comes about from sperm and egg fusing together from that part of sexual reproduction. So molecular evolution is hugely detailed. Very quickly, we are in the field of DNA biology, and we have to have a very intimate, intricate knowledge of DNA biology just so that we can understand the accumulated changes over time. So I hope this gives you a sense of this discipline of molecular evolution and that behind a lot of the conclusions and a lot of the things that we talk about, this molecular evolution is there. It's now a, a very strong piece of evidence showing us relatedness or non-relatedness between species. As always, email me if you get questions.